Hi, I'm Chris Wayless, and uh, you're watching a pre-recorded video. Uh, sadly, I cannot uh, do Zoom meetings because I am hearing impaired, and Zoom just doesn't work for me. So I've uh, pre-recorded a bunch of stuff for you, um, plus a couple of little videos I've done over the past couple of years. Um, this is hopefully stuff you'll enjoy. Uh, I, I put together this video so it's a bit episodic. I may jump around, so please forgive all that stuff. I'm just trying to fill an hour with some fun stuff. Mostly what I'm doing is I reminisce about Gremlins and I'll talk about a lot of what I've been up to lately doing the past few years of uh, finally getting pretty much retired. <laughs> so anyway, um, I hope you'll be very forgiving about the technical qualities of the video, but I do hope you'll enjoy the stuff I've got uh, put together for you. Some insights on uh, how to do some stuff that I've been up to, uh, as well as just a lot of silly stuff as well. So um, here's hoping you have a good time with it, and I'll see you on the other end. One of the movies that I get asked about the most, uh, in fact it's the movie I get asked about the most, period. <laughs> That's Gremlins, not surprisingly, which I did way back when, 30 what is it, 35, 37 years ago now? I, I don't even remember. Um, and it was, without question, the single most difficult, most challenging film I ever worked on. And it really changed my position in the industry as well as changed my entire sort of work attitude. Uh, it was a monstrous picture, for the, especially for the budget we had, which wasn't much. It was a studio picture, but it was considered a low-budget studio picture at, uh, I think it was 10 million or something like that initially. And uh, <clears throat> it was uh, just an astonishing experience because it just kept growing and growing and growing. And that, for me, was pretty terrifying. Uh, it started out as a relatively simple uh, just horror movie, you know, the, the gremlins, all the mogwai, there was no gizmo, of course, all the mogwai turned into, uh, gremlins, which in the early script were still called mogwai, even when they were gremlins. So I, uh, that was actually one of the things I, I asked to change, uh, because this was a very confusing picture moving into it and just looking at all the complexities of the script and the characters. And I said, I, I asked Joe Dante, I said, please, can we just refer to the changed Mogwai as Gremlins for conversational purposes? And fortunately, he said, yeah, that's a, we should do that. <laughs> and uh, I got the script. I had been working with Joe Dante and Mike Fennell on the 3D remake of uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon for Universal. Uh, that fell through, unfortunately. And then Mike Fennell called and said, well, we've got this other project we'd love you to have a look at. And I read the script and it was, you know, a special effects person's nightmare with just thousands of gremlins, poor, thousands of mogwai, correct? <laughs> uh, thousands of mogwai rampaging through the town, hordes of mogwai doing this. And it was just, I remember reading the script, shaking my head, going, how are they going to do this? <laughs> uh, and then Mike Fennell called and said, well, what, do you, what did you think? And I said, I, I read it and I think it's impossible. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> so from that start point, we, uh, we embarked on a long, hard journey. <laughs> um... It was fun. It was very fun, though, uh, you know, coming up with the uh, design for the Mogwai and the Gremlins was uh, pretty straightforward, actually. You know, I did some very, very rough sketches. I mean, really rough sketches. Um, and Joe was eh, a little more like this, a little more less of that, different color here, try that. I did a couple of maquettes of uh, the Mogwai, which I think Joe... Uh, I think Bob Burns has, actually. And uh, 
that was sort of the starting point. And it was a project that I went into not really knowing what the heck I was doing. I had done puppets before and some uh, animatronics work, but nothing, nothing remotely on the scale of this. So it was a earn while you learn proposition. And we had, uh, we had enough time to get stuff together, except that everything kept changing. Uh, you know, the whole attitude of the film changed pretty quickly, you know, from the first draft to the second or third, I guess it was. So, you know, Joe Dante was bringing his bizarre, wonderful sense of humor to it. And uh, I can't remember at what point it was that Steven Spielberg suggested that uh, one of the Mogwai not change into a gremlin, but actually become Billy's friend. And <laughs> Honestly, I thought it was going to ruin the movie. <laughs> Obviously, it didn't. So that, was a, uh, so that was an additional character, essentially, because all of the Mogwai turned into the, all, it turned into the gremlins at one point, except now we have another Mogwai that has the entire run of the rest of the movie and does an awful lot of stuff that he was not originally planned to do. So we had a, a, it was a very, very crazy time. We, my shop was up in um, Marin County, Northern California, and we uh, basically built everything we could there and then uh, built a shop in a 40 foot trailer and brought that down uh, to the set and worked out of that for the most part until things started really getting crazy. We just started expanding and expanding and expanding and we literally put up walls on the stage and, and created our own space. It was a, it was a fun movie to do. It was, I mean, it was a killer for me. It was really a killer. Um, I, you know, I averaged like three or four hours of sleep a, a night for, and this is for seven months or something like that. And so it was a real endurance challenge and it was a real challenge just coming up with uh, rigs and ideas to keep up with all the, the concepts and the changes that were always happening. You know, the new scenes were appearing where suddenly Gizmo had to do this or that or something else. And there were scenes that were cut out that we just didn't get right. You know, we, we tried a lot of rigs and most of them worked really well. A couple of them kind of worked okay, but it wasn't really enough by the time we got to shooting. We didn't have enough uh, actually filming time. You know, it's just one of those things. You always lose something. So there was a lot of testing and... Uh, strangeness going on in terms of just like how weird can we go to you know with these characters because part of it was you know we didn't they didn't have a lot of character in the script they did things mischievous things bad things but they didn't really uh they didn't really have that gremlins crazy uh manic quality to them so this was all stuff that was developing as we were building puppets. And it wound up that when we were down there, it, all the puppets we had built just weren't enough. And so we had to continually create puppets as we went along. And so I had my shop up in Northern California just cranking out gremlin parts because it was mostly gremlins at that point. We did have some additional... Uh, uh, gizmo rigs. We decided to go with the oversized puppet, uh, which is about three feet tall for gizmo and one for the, uh, a regular Mogwai uh, at some point. So that was all, that was all built in uh, Northern California. But a lot of the puppets, especially the gremlins, wound up being essentially built on the set, you know, sometimes overnight. And so we had this assembly line uh, to the other for it and it was a it was a shoot that just kept evolving you know uh, once we I think the first shot we dressed them up put any clothes on them at all was the uh, the Christmas carolers outside of Mrs. Deagle's and uh, once we did that everybody just went crazy for it and said oh boy boy these are gonna be fun now you know and that's really kind of when it started kicking in uh you know we shot all that was all uh, exterior backlot stuff so that was uh early on in the shoot so suddenly these these gremlins 
are getting more and more character. Uh, they're laughing a lot more. They're looking at each other a lot more. You know, a lot of stuff that uh, added to the depth of the character. And um, overall, the shoot was, uh, as I say, it was a tough one for me. I broke my ankle. I had a kidney stone. I was just like, you know, struggling to keep up with the, the, the show. And we had a lot of... Uh, issues come up along the way. The whole theater scene was initially thought of as a smaller scene. And then it was like, how are we going to get, you know, a couple of hundred gremlins in a, in a theater and, uh, and, and keep them all puppeteered? Because we didn't have that big a puppeteering uh, crew. So that's where we wound up making a lot of uh, a lot more puppets for it. We came up with the helmet gremlins, which I think our production manager came up with. I can't remember. Basically a helmet with a, a, a coffee can we got from craft services uh, strung onto it. And we've just stuck a, a gremlin on top there and then two gremlins on each hand. And so suddenly one operator is operating three puppets. So that was, that was a bit of a labor saver. But that was all built. Those were all built uh, on the set. And so it was kind of a playing catch up uh, the whole time. You know, I was, uh, and it was, and like I say, it was changing. There'd be a shot in the show where it was, uh, you know, there were no gremlins in the shot, right? And then suddenly, well, it would be nice if we had one in the foreground here. And suddenly the shot would have to have 12 gremlins. So I'd have to pull my crew from making new gremlin puppets to get this shot done on the set. And... So there was a lot, pretty fair amount of that actually, which didn't help. <laughs> but we knew Joe was doing a great job of just making this into something really unique. Uh, at one point, uh, I can't remember what we were shooting. Joe came along and came up to me and said, "I don't know who's going to come see this movie, but it sure is fun making it." <laughs> and I and I think that that was kind of like what worked about the movie. You know, it's just really crazy, dark fun. And there was a lot of stuff that uh, was in the early uh, version of the script that was very, very dark. I'm sure a lot of you have heard, you know, the, uh, the gremlins kill the mom and throw her, roll her head down the stairs and uh, they eat the dog and much more horror movie stuff. That actually went out the door pretty quickly. Um, you know, the whole horror aspect of it, Joe didn't really want to go in that direction. So we didn't, we never really built a lot of, there were no, uh, no gore effects, no gruesome stuff that we ever did. We didn't, uh, we didn't get to life casting anybody or anything like that. Um, but we did build a lot of rigs that are not in the movie. Uh, there's a ton of stuff we built for the, um, the bar scene and we shot, we shot for a week on that one scene, which is a long time. And it was pretty crazy. Uh, it was, uh, one, one new surprise after another. Uh, we had been filming enough that everybody on the crew had a sense of fun with the gremlins and somebody literally put up a, a, a list, uh, on the, uh, on the wall on the set and said, if anybody's got an idea of what the gremlins can be doing, you know, just write it down here. And I'm like, what, you're killing me. <laughs> um, but we tried our best to keep up with it. There is somewhere in Joe Dante's basement or something, a very long cut of the, uh, of the bar scene. I hope that shows up someday if it hasn't already. So it was, a. Uh, I, it was a once in a lifetime experience for sure. And I don't have a lot of stuff left from it, but I do have some. I have number 27. They were labeled on the back there. I don't know if that shows up. <laughs> uh, I think there were 40 of these. These are these stop motion uh, puppets that Pete Kleinow animated all by himself, which I can't even, I can't even conceive of that. That's an impossible 
task, and he did it great. But they, uh, that, that's, we did not make these. These did not come from my crew. They were done by the guys at uh, Fantasy 2, I think. They just gave me one for the heck of it, which was nice. Stripes Skull. It's uh, all, the, all the bits. This is from the, where was this? The mar marionette, I think, that uh, comes out of the fountain. And it was covered with all sorts of melting foam and latex and garbage, but that's all rotted away, unfortunately. Got the big guy here. This is a fiberglass copy uh, that I had made after the show, just so I'd have something for memory. And this is Gizmo's box, the original, with all the, uh, the sides are all removable, the uh, bottom comes out, and this is the one that he comes out of in the movie. And, uh, and unfortunately, he's in terrible, terrible shape, but this is the, my last little gizmo I've got. He's falling apart, and I'll see if I can repair him a bit. Uh, I don't even know what we used this puppet for. I know it was used, but I don't know in what scene or anything like that. So, that's kind of what I've got left. I got some other stuff. I got Billy's backpack. I got a bunch of, uh, a couple of rotting uh, um, Mogwai heads. I've got the original maquette I did of the Gremlins, uh, the Gremlin, which was really fun. That's where I, that was my first sort of, first intuition that uh, this, mo this movie could be really cool. But it was, a, 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 you know, like I say, it was a real life changing uh, movie. After I made that movie, I felt like I'm not going to be afraid of taking on a, a tough job anymore because <laughs> there's probably not ever going to be another job as tough as Gremlins was. And there never was. I never had a job that uh, there were, there were some tough ones. The fly was really tough because we had, that was mostly a time crunch more than anything. We literally had half the time we, we normally would have had on a picture like that. So that was, you know, that was why uh, after Gremlins, I, I, was not, I went into the most intimidating meetings in Hollywood and I was unafraid. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, that I should say that what amazes me about Gremlins uh, uh, continually has amazed me for all these decades is that it's turned into such a strange classic uh, that it's still so alive. It seems like it's almost more popular now than it was, you know, two decades ago with all these new really cool toys coming out. I'm like, where were these, where were these manufacturers when the movie was made? The stuff coming out today is just great. Really love it. Um... And it astonishes me that there's a market for that, that people still love it that much, still remember it that well, that fondly, that it's, it just doesn't seem real sometimes. Uh, but I, to all of you out there who still love Gremlins, who still support all the merchandising and everything else, the collectibles, thank you. Because I'll tell you, it's a real reward for me just to know that my work sort of still still lives on in people's hearts and minds and imagination. Thanks. Okay, so I think we've uh, spent about enough time above ground, so let's head down to my basement shop, which I call the dungeon. Here's why. painted it like this for a, uh, a fake trailer I did a couple of years ago. I just always wanted to paint a basement like this. So this is a storage room, some uh, material supplies, etc. Very hard to see. The far door there is a fabrication room where I try to do my clean work. This door over here, uh, that one, is my workshop, which we'll go into in a bit. 
This is our laundry room and it has bars on the windows because we have some pretty serious laundry sometimes. And this is uh, the studio which we'll head into in just a little bit as well. So I get to come down here and play almost every single day. So here we are in my actual workshop. That door is the paint department which no human should ever have to enter. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, pretty busy workshop. I mentioned uh, I'm a part of a group called Dark Arbor Lodge and we have a lot of fun projects together. Last year we did an art show called Innsmouth uh, that I did these for. This was a fish man mask that my daughter Zena actually started and she just gave up on, wasn't really that interested. So I finished it off and uh, I'm really glad I did because she came up with some interesting forms that I would never have come up with. This was a mask I made for her for the show. She actually was a costumed fish man for the show. You can see the mouth op operates the gills and very fun show. Uh, in fact, here's a, here's a quick look at it. It was the upstairs of a billiard hall here in Portland that we basically reworked quite a bit to create much, much more of a, an environmental experience. And uh, we used a lot of paper mache in, in this. I used a lot. Uh, and a couple of the other artists used paper mache as well. We did these cutouts that were backlit from these cloth uh, walls we put up to hide the billiard tables. And uh, they worked really, really well, actually. They were very sort of uh, atmospheric. Uh, this is actually just before the show, so the lighting's not exactly right. But we had, as you can see, photos, masks, uh, various art objects, a little Innsmouth girl. Uh, well, you know, all these wonderful uh, lamps and uh, lights. This is a figure I did, an Innsmouth guy, again, all paper mache. Uh, he was fun, a bit of a challenge doing the clothing, especially. Uh, various Pacific tiki uh, Innsmouth inspired masks. Uh, that's a marionette being dressed up, a uh, high priest. Uh, unfortunately, the light's not showing you these cutouts very well, but they were fun. And uh, this corner was uh, mostly my corner. I think I, everything here is mine. A bunch of masks. Um, this big Again, paper mache deep one I, I did very quickly. That was a very fast one. And uh, even the uh, the miniature fishing shop is paper mache. And we had a bunch of goods to sell as well. And because you didn't see Zena's uh, fish man suit, here's a, here's a shot of her in the backyard. She's got quite a bit of uh, lifts in those feet. And because my other daughter, Dana, was there to help suit up, every time the two of these get together, they just have to dance for some reason. Anyway, the suit was a big hit. Doing Innsmouth was a lot of fun, and so seriously, you know, if you're, in a, if you're an artist, find other artists, get together, have fun together. You'll be amazed at what you come up with. That's what we did with Dark Arbor Lodge, and we love it. So normally every Halloween, we do a big Halloween party that has a theme going for it. This year, uh, we're not having that party, unfortunately, for obvious reasons. I did start on some decorations for it, though. Our theme this year was going to be Outer Limits and uh, Twilight Zone. So I actually wound up making literally, like, I think 24 of these... Uh, Xanti Misfits that I was going to be hanging all over the walls and that would have been really cool. And then 
over here uh, this was the uh, one of the spacemen from uh, the Twilight Zone episode entitled uh, Invaders he was a really fun one to work on I love that this was from uh, another uh, Outer Limits uh, can't remember the name of it counterpoint maybe I'm wrong anyway this is really quick and simple just paper mache which So, yeah, I love ape suits. Always have since I was a kid. I, you know, Charlie Gamora, Crash Corrigan, the classic Hollywood gorilla guys. Absolutely loved them all my life. It's funny, I didn't really get a chance to do a lot of ape suits in my career. I did do a couple, but uh, they were very sort of minory kind of things. So as I retired, I decided to start to play a little bit more and do the things I always wanted to do that I never got a chance to do. So that's making gorilla suits and stuff. So I did that and uh, I became a, an administrator on the Facebook page, Ape Suits Cinema, which is all about ape suits in modern society as well as uh, historically in film and television specifically. But we do cover a lot of uh, a lot of historical, theatrical aspects of ape suits as well. I know, crazy, but it's fun, and it really is fun. And a couple of years ago, we had a, a trailer contest just to do a fake ape suit, ape movie trailer. And uh, it was fun. I did one. It was started out, it was supposed to be a, a two minute, quick little thing with just, you know, basically me as a mad scientist and my daughter as a as a gorilla, a mad gorilla or something like that. And it just grew and grew and grew into this eight plus minute long, fun, silly tribute to the old Universal and Hammer style horror movies. It's called The Apes of Frankenstein. We really had a lot of fun doing it. It was a lot of the people involved who quite soon afterwards became Dark Arbor Lodge. And for me, it was great because I got to do a lot of the stuff I wanted to do as like a 14 year old, uh, making a lot of miniatures, uh, cheating, uh, old school technique and, and, uh, and building a bunch of ape suits. And I had a lot of fun with it. Um, and I think you might like to see it. So just realize when you look at this, it's, it's not professional, okay? <laughs> These are not professional actors. It's really just a bunch of us goofing around, friends having fun. I think we are all being our 14-year-old self on this one. So have a look, see what you think. Uh, it's also on my YouTube channel. Uh, there's, I'm, this is the black and white version I'm showing, but the color version is there as well. And uh, uh, you'll see, it's just a lot of fun. And you know, for whatever it was, 500, 600 bucks at most. It's okay. <laughs> anyway, here it is. Have a look. He was such a fine specimen. Dr. Frankenstein will find out why the ape died. Frankenstein, eh? I only hope he is not following in his grandfather's footsteps. Perhaps I should pay him a visit. Dr. Frankenstein. 
Your work with Bokenga is miraculous. A simple revivification. Revive the brain and you revive the body. But is it right to do that? He did die a natural death. Now he'll never have to die again. There are no morals in science, Moreau. Only what is known and what is not yet known. And we stand on the threshold between the two. Well, that all sounds just as it should be, Doctor. Still, it does seem odd. I have nothing to hide on this. Well, I hope you won't mind if I do a little investigating myself, eh? Without evidence, there's nothing we have seen to say that there's monsters. I'm sure the good constable is just sleeping off a good night's revelations. The Hefeweizen is very strong this year, and the court is well known. There's nothing to fear from the good Baron von Frankenstein. No heartbeat. No sign of life. what any of you say. Frankenstein is up to something. But there is no proof of anything, Johan! The constable is dead! Every bone in his body broken! What more proof do you need? My dearest, I see you finally returned home to me. Oh, and I see for us you've bought a friend. Frankenstein, this madness must stop. I quite agree, Moro. <laughs>
So you can see we got carried away, or I got carried away, especially. Uh, you know, crowd scenes, miniatures, explosions, all kind of goofy stuff I just decided to go to town with. But it was a great experience. Really, really fun. That was the most fun I've had in a long time. Uh, so you should try it. Uh, check us out uh, uh, on Ape Suit Cinema on Facebook. Check out the... Uh, I have a couple of uh, videos on the making of a couple of the suits uh, on my... I think they're on my YouTube channel as well as on my website, chriswaylesscreatures.com. So have a look and um, see what you see. One of the projects I'm working on these days uh, is a Dark Arbor Lodge project and uh, we've just started uh, we're still planning but I've got a head start on some of the stuff uh, one of which is this half-scale werewolf puppet so he's pretty fun simple animalistic monstrous <sighs> Simple hand, rod, puppet, should be fun. It's only gonna be for a few shots. Uh, and you'll notice, I don't know if you can see it on this guy here yet. Probably not close, the light's not close enough to the camera. The eyes do glow and uh, that's a front projection material behind the glass eye. Uh, another thing I've got going for it is uh, the moon! <laughs> really, yeah, it's the moon! Can't you tell? Uh, this is another use of paper mache, which, you know, I'm big on, I gotta tell you. It's, it was a lot easier and certainly a lot cheaper to make a big paper mache moon over a ball than a balloon then it would be to sculpt and out of foam or anything like that so there's a lot of advantages to the paper mache anyway there's a lot of stuff going to be happening on this dark arbor lodge project so you might want to keep tabs with the dark arbor lodge uh facebook page and the website although the facebook page is is more active but uh, we got a lot of stuff to build for it it's gonna be a lot of fun I'm actually building a half scale of this half scale puppet, which makes it quarter scale. The challenge in that is that I have to scale down material for. It's not going to be easy, it's going to be a pain. So I'm going through samples of various other furs that just started out white as well that are shorter fiber. Color is going to be a pain, but not that big a pain. Anyway, it's just some cool challenging stuff. I love challenges and we're gonna do some fun stuff there. So that's, uh, that's where we're at on that Dark Arbor Lodge project. So here we are uh, in the paint room in my dungeon laboratory. <laughs> and uh, this is without question the deepest, darkest corner of the dungeon. It's always a mess, it's always filthy, no matter how many times I clean it, no matter how often I clean it, it just gets dirty faster than any place else down here. So what I'm working on right now is a, a mask. Um, this I did, I sculpted on live sessions on Dark Arbor Lodge's page, and it's sort of a gremlin goblin-y kind of guy, inspired by gremlins anyway. So. As you can see, he's not finished. I, I actually ran out of paint, <laughs> which was weird because that's not something I normally do. Anyway, he's fun. Uh, he, I did this a little bit differently. Uh, it was a two-part latex casting. Actually, the horns and ears were separate, but the main head was two parts. I actually cast front and back. And then I built an EVA foam underskull in there so that I could do a, a moving mouth. Uh, mask on it which works really well I was surprised I had a lot of doubts anyway that's what I'm working on um, I always have more than one project going on so I've got a paper mache critter that I need to be painting he's all prepped and ready to go this is a good size for paper mache it's easier to work than smaller stuff and it's not so big that it becomes cumbersome but that's 
you know, that changes all the time. I, you know, I do big paper mache and small paper mache. In fact, one of the paper mache things you might want to take a look at, which I'm going to show you now, my little video on it, is a paper mache figure I did of Wilbur Waitley from the Dunwich Horror H.P. Lovecraft uh, short story. It's big. It's not quite nine feet tall, but it's pretty big. And it was very ambitious for me because this was still early on in my sort of paper mache learning curve. So without further ado, uh, have a look at this one and it'll give you some idea of what you can really do with paper mache. It's actually pretty amazing. So here's Wilbur. Wilbur Waitley is a very bizarre character created by H.P. Lovecraft in his short story, The Dunwich Horror. And he always fascinated me. He's a real mix and mashup of all kind of bizarre, unrelated elements. And I decided to do a paper mache figure of him. He's huge, and for me, I hadn't even attempted anything this size, so it was a great learning experience for me. The frame was basically a two inch PVC pipe that had to be heavily reinforced because it wobbled so much. And I found that I had to work my way from the bottom up to gain greater stability and strength so that as I worked, the piece actually got stronger and stronger. This was a childhood fascination for me. I, I just loved the description of the character. It was very, very strange. And I always wondered if it was even feasible to make it look like the parts belong to each other. At any rate, I kept at it. Uh, a lot of the frame, especially the torso and legs, were built out with cardboard first and then crumpled paper to define the forms a little bit more. And I use a lot of brown paper, uh, like grocery uh, shopping bags, for heavier and larger projects like this, just because they build up a, a really good strength very, very quickly. And so it was a, a matter of defining things slowly, uh, piece by piece. And the great thing about working on a figure this large is that you don't have to worry too much about drying time simply because by the time you finish one section and are letting it that dry, you can hop to the other side and, and do an arm or a leg or a tail or whatever it is. Uh, and in that way, this was a pretty continual project, which was good because I, I think this was about six weeks of work. I started in August for a uh, display at the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival here in Portland, and I think that was the first week of October, maybe something like that. And I was doing other projects uh, at the same time. So once I have the paper mache, paper strip forms done, uh, and it's really solid. Uh, I start with my paper mache pulp. This is a not quite clay-like uh, material, but it's a mix of shredded paper and glue and a few other things, and it works to do the final detail layer. It works very differently than clay and I had to come up with a lot of new techniques to be able to get the level of detail and texture that I was looking for. And eventually it, it, it worked out really, really well. I was very happy with the way it happened. Here you see the beginning of a bunch of tentacles coming from his abdomen, which is one of the more bizarre aspects of the character. This was a lot harder than I thought because all, I think there's 20 something tentacles, they all had to be coordinated uh, and then done separately and then placed separately and finished separately. It wasn't uh, as easy as just building up the rest of it uh, as I did with the rest of the, the figure. The tentacles here, again, had to be done uh, individually. These are basically wire forms, crumpled paper, and then paper strip on top of that. Here you see me trying to figure out how to make them look like writhing tentacles and still 
not uh, create such a mess that I couldn't work with it. I also had to reinforce the base quite a bit, uh, added plywood, uh, casters, I added foam, I added uh, many layers of uh, hard cardboard on top. This wound up being quite a, a, a heavy piece, much heavier than I expected, especially as I wound up putting a lot of uh, thicker layers of the paper mache pulp on. Here you see the individual tentacles being uh, finished and paper mache in place. The figure itself uh, is about just under nine feet tall. The first head I started was basically a clay sculpture that I did paper strip on top of. And I got it fairly well along until I just decided I hated that head and I, I threw it away. I abandoned it and started again in a different technique using uh, corrugated cardboard to build up the head form and, uh, and then did my paper strip on top of that. The head, because I really didn't want to be working on it uh, at nine feet in the air, I decided to make uh, removable so I could finish it off. I did three sets of eyes because I wasn't sure what size was going to fit. Finally wound up going with the largest ones. And at the same time, I, I was trying to draw the two separate sections together, that is the neck and the head. I knew I was going to be able to cover it quite easily because he's quite hairy, quite, uh, quite a hefty beard on him, and I knew that was going to disguise any joint, but the joint still had to get quite close to be able to do that. And I finally got there, the head came along to a point where I was much happier with it, and I'm so glad I actually did make that change. One of the great things about paper mache in general is it's not a big deal to redo anything. It's very easy to just cut sections out and replace them. So it's a very uh, malleable system in that sense. I didn't want to use any human hair, synthetic hair. This is actually jute fiber that's been dyed, plant fiber, and applied. I wanted much coarser, hef heftier kind of feel to the, to the hair, and this did a good job of it. And then it got to the point of painting, which was a lot more of a challenge than I thought, uh, because it's so wildly different as Lovecraft uh, describes it. The sort of reptilian legs, the uh, obvious eyes in his hips. Where did he come up with that one? Anyway, so it's very fleshy there. The tentacles are fleshy. The the uh, obviously the head arms are much more skin textured, and yet the torso had this weird yellow black piebald coloration that's very specific in the in the story. So this was a this was part of a the challenge for me was really trying to bring together all these uh, disparate uh, elements into one figure. It's still bizarre by any stretch of the imagination. And his uh, legs were hairy in the description, so I did wind up going with a synthetic fur for that that I thickened and made look much more coarse uh, with some acrylic gel that I used. I was very happy the way that came out as well. You can see it here. Uh, very coarse looking. And that's pretty much how he came together. Uh, he was a big success at both an art show and the Lovecraft Festival. And I'm just so glad that I'm probably never going to attempt anything that size again.
yeah, bigger, more ambitious than I thought when I started. <laughs> but he came out really well, and he, he was a bit of a rush job. I had to get him done for an art show, and uh, I was quite worried. It came down to the line, uh, but I did finish on time, and it was a big hit. He was definitely the centerpiece of the whole show. So, that was good. <laughs> One of the things... Uh, sorry. One of the things I want to talk about before uh, my hour's up <laughs> is paper mache and I want to talk about it because it's really cool. Um, a lot of people are always asking me, you know, I want to make creatures, I want to make statues, but I can't afford, you know, to make a three foot long thing out of super scopy and I can't afford silicones for molds and everything else. So I always tell them, just try paper mache. It's pretty amazing. I've been doing this for about, what is it, four or five years now, I think. And, uh, it's just really cool. It's uh, uh, it's very, very versatile. I came across it because uh, I was going to have a second implant done on my second ear, and I knew there was going to be some real downtime in my recovery time. So seeing what uh, some people were doing on the internet, I decided to give it a shot. And I really had a blast with it. Just really, really fun. I mean, there's definitely a learning curve, but you know, it's pretty cheap. And you can do some amazing stuff. Uh, here's a, this was a very quick mask I made for uh, the Innsmouth project, uh, art project, and it was just to be worn on a mannequin, but it was fun, you know, very, very quick. I did a lot of quick stuff on that one. Here's another one I did. Really kind of like this guy. He's almost got a 50s throwback vibe to him. And uh, it's, it's, like I said, very versatile material. <clears throat> Here's a gorilla mask. And yeah, it moves. So it's, see my fingers in there, I think. <laughs> I didn't quite finish it off. So it's just a really amazing, versatile material. It's great for props. I think you saw I did a prop moon. Uh, I've done all kinds of stuff with it. I did a, a War of the Worlds Martian, one Halloween, um, uh, just, it seems to be adaptable to pretty much anything. And here's this guy behind me, which was one of my very early ones, and that's all paper mache, different versions of mixes. Uh, the stone base is one mix, the, the skin texture is another, the uh, scales are another. You can do a lot with it, and there's tons and tons of tutorials online. If you haven't tried paper mache for making monsters and fun stuff, you should give it a shot, because it really is fun. I do have a book coming out on my techniques for paper mache. Uh, I'll probably do a Kickstarter for it in a couple of months. It's called Creating Creatures. And uh, if you follow me on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, I'll definitely put up notices there when it happens. I do have two Facebook pages. One is my regular personal page, and uh, the other one is Chris Whale's Creatures. That's for all my fun stuff, like all this craziness. And uh, I do have a website, chriswhalescreatures.com, which has a fair amount of stuff on it at this point, some fun stuff and worth taking a look at. And I will be updating that and posting new stuff as I get there. Uh, so please feel free to follow me on any and every <laughs> platform you can find. Uh, anyway, I think my hour is probably just about up. I haven't edited this yet, so I don't know. So I want to just say that uh, it's been a, a great opportunity for me to be here digitally and share some of what I've done and some of what I'm doing now with you guys. Uh, I hope I haven't bored you too much, and uh, thanks again, and hopefully one of these years we'll be able to see each other in person. Take care.